forward to this one, and we've titled it, subtitled it a Uganda case study because it might seem counterintuitive because of the the troubles that we've already heard from uh, several panelists around uh, the the longevity of Yoruba Museveni in um, Museveni, sorry, in, uh, in in Uganda, and um, the sort of strictures of his regime. Um, we have there's quite a mixed uh, mixed message com coming through in some respects. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, they've been um, told some really interesting and positive and creative and uh, welcoming engagements between uh, society in Kampala and new uh, 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 refugees coming in from the, the former uh, Somalia from Burundi. And yet at the same time, we know that there's this really deeply anti-human attitude towards the LGBTI community as well. So a very mixed picture, but we've got some fascinating initiatives springing up in, uh, in Uganda, um, all centered on the city of Kampala. And um, without wasting too much time, I, I think I'd like to go just from my from our right on downwards through our, our panelists and ask them to first of all describe their particular projects. We'll, we'll start with uh, we'll, we'll we'll start with you and uh, your uh, to safety hub uh, uh, program. We mentioned it earlier, beginning of the day, but get an idea of how it works in practice in uh, in Kampala and then. Uh, and then move on to the other initiatives in the room, uh, really turning Kampala into quite a, uh, a unique center for arts protection, art rights, justice in the continent. So thank you so much. Good afternoon. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I'm the only one who's not based in Uganda, whoever who's here, but we work closely with the uh, Pan African Human Rights Defenders Network. I am with the Southern Africa Human Rights Defenders Network. So, um, as I said earlier on, the, the initiative that we are, we are collaborating is called the Open to Up Cities, which creates safe cities around uh, the whole of uh, Africa. So, the one in, in, in East Africa is based in Kampala. So, what we do is uh, Relocate. This this is where there's a lot of relocations for people from um, um, Somalia, uh, Kenya, also in Tanzania. But I think I can speak more uh, later on, depending on what else you say. That's a nice way of um, of uh, of, buying, of buying time. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michael, for. Um, uh, for this Ugandan case study, and thank you, friends, for coming for, for this session. Um, Uganda is a very interesting uh, scenario. Uh, Professor Eileen Marie Tripp uh, calls the 70s regime a hybrid regime in the sense that it has some tendencies of democracy, uh, like regular elections. At the same time, has uh, tendencies of tyranny, like uh, clamping down on the opposition and critical voices. Uh, if you have watched Ivana News, you will see that almost every day uh, the opposition people are beaten up. And it's in this context of a hybrid regime that some of the creative initiatives can take place, uh, like Penny Uganda, that can work in prisons and publish a book. Uh, some of the some of whose works are quite critical of the government in a satirical way, of course, not directly. Uh, now, um, Uganda, as many of you are aware, I think hosts uh, the world's the world's uh, largest number of displaced people. Uh, Uganda hosts one million five hundred thousand people, um, and that's a lot. That's a lot of people that are to be hosted. And, and as Ugandans, we are proud of this. Um, you don't hear of cases where there have been attacks. You don't hear of cases of uh, widespread xenophobia. 
the isolated cases, of course, they're there. We're not here of um, uh, terrible cases of xenophobia and so on. And 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 this has helped the Sevenis regime. Because the Sevenis are very cunning, cunning animal. Uh, this has helped the Sevenis regime in at least two uh, ways. Uh, in the first way, it has eased pressure on Europe and the US. Most of the uh, most of the displaced people in Africa end up in Europe and, and the US. But by hosting 1,500,000 people, uh, that means that um, seven has eased pressure on Europe and the US. But secondly, and, and shockingly, uh, it has given um, seven some life blood in terms of finances. Because the hosting of uh, displaced people comes with financial rewards, if you like. I'm putting it a bit cynically. But, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the bodies that have to do with displaced people and so on, they actually bring in money to support, to support the displaced people and so on. And this money has been very supportive of the Sevenis regime. And so we should not say the Sevenis benevolent because uh, he's hosting 1 million thousand people. It has actually helped him elongate his uh, regime because the West sees him uh, as a devil, yes, but also as someone who is easy pressure. And so, uh, at the end of Uganda, we noticed that many writers, there are two categories of displaced people, those who are living in refugee camps and those who are living on their own. So we noticed that most of the, uh, the few displaced writers living on their own were staying in places where writing was not possible. They were staying in the slums around Kampala and in places without power sometimes, electricity, in places without internet and so on. So we came up with a... a a project called the Made Space Project. We rented out a house in one of the Kampala suburbs called Namuongo, I think about two kilometers from the city center. And in this place, we have internet connectivity, we have seats, and people come and work from there. And we don't have any signposts. <laughs> people ask us, why don't you have a signpost? Because we don't want to attract attention to ourselves. So uh, through what I call it an arterial network, if I can borrow the, 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 the beautiful name from uh, our senior colleague from Zimbabwe. Through arterial network, the writers inform other writers about this space and then they come and work here. So in the process of establishing a library, uh, English pen has promised us 100 books so that when the writers come, they can read. And I would have built all of you. If you have a book you have read and it's lying on your shelf, uh, uh, idly, please give it to us so that these writers, when they come to work in this space, they can read. We'd like them to read as much as, as possible so that um, um, they, they can really see the space as a, a space that is um, uh, enriching their writing better. We are also working on an anthology. So what happens is when the writers come, we ask them to volunteer, to give workshops to, to one another. So they are, they are giving workshops on translation, they are giving workshops on uh, creative writing and so on. And the idea is that by the end of next year, we'd like to have an anthology uh, from their own work. The displaced writers who are working there, will, and so far we have five pieces that we have received. And also we'd like the, uh, them, we are we we going to work out, uh, we haven't got the permission yet from uh, the Prime Minister's office, which is the office in charge of uh, refugee camps. Would like to move with them to refugee camps so that we can have creative writing workshops with uh, the writers in the refugee camps so that we can come up with uh, an anthology that contains the work of those who are in Kampala and are living on their own and the work of those who are in refugee camps. But for this place to be good, we need coffee, of course. We have a coffee machine. We need all, all, all the things that you would like to have in a, an artistic space. And it's not easy, of course. We have very little money. Uh, we don't have many books, and we appeal to you for support. Uh, I think in, in, uh, in one of the sessions we said we should also fund our own initiatives. We don't have to look to the West all the time. I think giving us one book, how many are we here? We are about 50. Those are 50 books, and those are 50 lives that will be changed by your books. Thank you. Um, I mentioned a bit my organization, a bit about my organization earlier, but maybe to re echo. So, um, we provide a safe space for LBQ women to just 
express themselves. We used to provide ourselves space, now we are struggling, so we are we have moved from providing to continuing to attempt to provide a safe space. But we have like an office and we have um, what we call a social Friday, which happens every last Friday of the month. And what happens there is we just provide this space where LGBT people just come, mostly because we work with women, so LBQ women come together and just use art as a form of healing or telling their stories. So we transition between very many different forms of expression, including like body painting or people telling physical stories or reciting poems or acting. We just structure differently. And um, we realize that though our policies are bad, the violence itself happens at the grassroots. The people that violate us physically, mostly are people that we live with every day. The person, your neighbor next door, where you buy your things, where you go for medical care. And some of those people do not even speak English at all, or do not even have the chance to engage with policy. So how do we engage with them at a level where we speak a language they understand? So those are some of the ways in which we try to speak a language that they understand. If I sing a song in my local language about discrimination, it's easy for that person to understand that song than for me to say to them in English. If I act, if I dance, if I wear this nice shirt that says I'm queer and I'm here, maybe someone will ask what is queer and then we start that conversation. So we just provide that space where people have a chance to just express themselves as a way of healing but also as a way of trying to educate communities. Projects and expecting trauma to look a particular way. 
and expected displacement to follow on to representational tropes of what that suffering is or what, or what it should look like. So what we really tried to do was how can we invert that? And, and you'll see one piece of work in there that's called Kanyo Love. And Kanyo in Acholi means to endure, and, and love is the reference point that the artist took to work with women who had been forced into being wives with the Lord's Resistance Army and had returned. And she uh, did a project with them that's, that's now ongoing. Um, to look at how they experience love and what does love in the bush mean and what does love when you return mean and how does that understanding of love and, and that compassion work to, to invert that. So these are some of the things and, and we can talk more over dinner or, or more in terms of the details of how you bring together the research, the arts residency space, the conversation, the public festival and, and the technicalities of that. But there's two kind of points that I wanted to, to bring forward that I think are, are transferable. And, um, and one is about how Uganda can be, uh, as we've heard from, from Gloria, for people of the country, a very constricting space when it comes to freedom of expression. But for people who are fleeing from other destinations, like the DRC, like South Sudan, um, it can be a liberating space. So when we're thinking about safe havens, it's important to understand the dynamic of oppression, not just as a state-based issue that impacts the citizens, but what does that mean for people who are not from that place? And how do funding streams that are based around national and diplomatic references focus only on the national? or essentialize people as migrants and as refugees and therefore expect certain representational realities to come to the fore. Um, and then the second thing is about kind of transition and time and what um, dealing with these difficult issues and these conflict realities mean in terms of time and how sometimes the pop-up and the temporary and the spontaneous and the, and the safe and the, the sort of hyper-local space is the most appropriate space. So we don't necessarily need to be having permanent, sustainable, long-term forms of dealing with these things. We can also have small-scale, intimate, very local kinds of realities. And, and that is often where the safety comes in and where the, the people can feel a sense of over the exhibition or, or the space of expression. Okay, the, the, this intersection between, between, between forced migration and, and the arts. On the one hand, what's intriguing me here is this, this, this tone coming out of, the, of the, uh, the artist in exile as not the victim. Displaced, yes. Um, at risk, yes. Vulnerable, yes. But very much uh, the actor in their own story, um, with contributions to make of their own. Um, to through the exercise of their art, using art itself to create a safe space, because art itself is a safe space. Um, but also to use the, those artworks as interpretations of their experience that is maybe counter to what the, the big funding agencies or, no offense, but the Europeans, etc., project onto the, the African experience. So I find that quite interesting. This is very much, these, the, these, are, these are all essentially homegrown initiatives, and that the orientation is that these, these people have agency, they're not victims, um, yes, they have been displaced, they are vulnerable, but they are, they are definitely very active role players and uh, they, they are generators of a, a shared reality that is enabling and that is uh, em embracing more than even just their experience, um, that of their neighbors, their, 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 their host country. So, let, let's talk about origins, 
could you could you maybe talk about how your projects originated? Uh, where did the idea come from? Why did it take the form that it did? Um, where did you get the money? Yeah, I think I can speak on this one. Um, um, in regards to where the project originated, um, as it speaks for itself, we say the Ubuntu Hub Cities, which means to show that um, although this initi initiative was not there like in, in practice, it was there uh, through the um, notion that as African people we are always there to support each other through hard times. And uh, this can be seen through even liberation struggles and stuff, and stuff like that, that we were there to be able to protect each other in terms of need. So we thought it would be important for us to say as a human rights defender who is facing threat in, in, in his country, he can easily be relocated to another African country where he can uh, reintegrate and also be able to, to learn and um, exchange ideas with other fellow human rights defenders working in the same, uh, in the same uh, thematic areas. So in essence, we are saying um, it's, a it's a mechanism that is there to protect um, Africans within Africa. So that, uh, like someone said uh, something about culture shock, to say uh, as a person who's working in Marikana and you're yeah, under threat, and we you to uh, know where there's ice and, and snow, it becomes a difficult uh, situation for you to even uh, reintegrate. So, but we thought uh, it's essential for human rights defenders to be within the context and also to be within where they can find solidarity and, uh, um, and support from their fellow Africans. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, the, I think our project uh, has three, um, three aspects uh, that speak to its origin. The first aspect is um, two Eritrean uh, friends who are members of PEN International. And every time we would meet in other spaces other than Uganda, they would claim that Uganda is a better place than where they are. And one of them is in Norway. And of course I would, I would dispute that. And I would say, but why, why do you say that? They say, I was happier in Uganda where I stayed for three years as I was uh, working out uh, an asylum status with uh, the county where I am now. And I said, but why, did you, why, 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 why don't you go back? And he said, no, I cannot go back. I can, since I struggled to get asylum status in this country, I cannot go back to Uganda. But when I speak to all my friends who are fleeing Eritrea, they all want to come to Norway and I tell them to go to Uganda. So, um, you, know, you, you know, sometimes, sometimes we never appreciate you know, we live in a very repressive society, as Gloria has been telling you. And sometimes we never appreciate the fact that there are, there are spaces of freedom. Uh, and those spaces of freedom are taken for granted. So my interaction with these two Eritrean uh, people, who had stayed in Uganda for three years, but are now living, one in Canada and one in uh, Norway, uh, made me this, uh, uh, revisit revisit Uganda as a host country. I began asking myself, what, is, what makes Uganda uh, a better place than Norway? Which you can't even imagine anyway. Uh, in our colonial education, I think you're aware that uh, African people are colonized for about uh, 70 years, and that African people think that uh, European things are better, without even thinking through it. It's a, a colonial problem. Uh, an African girl, not all of them, will cut, will, will cover her beautiful hair with a wig a wig she had bought in a shop at about $20. Uh, and she would think that the wig is more beautiful than, uh, than her hair. And so that colonial problem, we are still struggling with it. We are still struggling to decolonize. And, and these two friends helped me to see that uh, there was something that we could build on. And that something was the kind of safe space that these people found in Uganda. The, the second thing was our prison project. Uh, we were doing creative writing workshops in school, in prisons, and the inmates were writing very critical work of the government. 
and they will perform this work when the warder, when the warder assigned to oversee what is happening, uh, is also sitting there. So sometimes after the performance, uh, we would engage uh, the warder in discussion, worried that our permission would be revoked any time. And the warder would say, um, I agree with them, but that my bosses she must never know. And we discovered that, in fact, uh, even a tyrant, even the worst tyrant, can never have complete control over the country. Even the worst tyrant will never have complete, because he's a human being, although they see themselves as gods. They, they, all, they have two eyes, they only see ahead of them, they don't see behind. Uh, they sleep, they're, they're, not, they're not gods who are omni awake. They sleep. So we discovered that, in fact, even a tyrannical space, you can manipulate it in some ways and you have a safe space where to, to pray. And then finally, uh, our relationship with the Fed International. When we discussed with them this idea, they said, oh, that's a brilliant idea, and I think we can support you with that. So they, they said they would give us money, but the, the deadline, I mean, the, 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 they would say in March, it never happens, uh, in, in May, it doesn't happen, and then we said, they start on our own. So the next time they asked us how far we had gone <coughs> with starting, we said we have been in this project for three months. And they were shocked to hear that. And they asked us how do you raise the money? We said, well, we, we used our personal monies to, to start the project. And that's when they said, oh, we are coming on, uh, on board. So I think that's how, uh, that's how uh, I can say we started. And uh, one thing about the 70s rule is that you know, he becomes very touchy when it comes to uh, his losing power. But these other things like, you know, writing, uh, things, if things don't have to do with him losing power, uh, you, you, you can go about it. But when it comes to him losing power, like, like him going on national radio and, and saying things about him, he will. So you find ways of, of dealing with the monsters. Like if you know that there's a snake in your house, you sleep with one eye open, so that uh, uh, in case a uh, snake comes, you have you have you have, uh, you, you, you have uh, a machete in one hand. Uh, so when you sleep, one eye sleeps, the other eye is looking out for, uh, for the snake. And that's how Uganda is. Or you have a beautiful pot, and you don't want to break the pot when the snake has entered there. You have to find a way of keeping this pot, but also ensure that the snake does not bite you. And that's how Uganda is, and I think with that in mind, for me, what comforts me is that a dictator will never have complete control over his or her country. And that gives me the courage to say, even one small thing that, like the five stories I have, those are already a success story, that these uh, writers who are coming to this space, there are not so many as yet, there are about six or seven. When we held, uh, on the day of the imprisoned writer, 15th November, we held a panel discussion there and it was published in the East Africa. And, and those are very minor achievements for people who are used to very big achievements. But for us as a center, those are very significant achievements. Thank you. Um, how did that project come about? Um, it started more as a social project because for us, a lot of healing has to happen in our community. Like a lot of healing. And um, very many LGBT people are scared. There is a lot you lose when you come out. So we had to think of a way of how do we enable people to say what they want to say without actually having to say it. I don't know if that makes sense. So we looked for alternative ways in which different people can express themselves and that was the best way in which we could all agree as a community. But also, I mentioned it earlier, everyone is artistic. It is just so funny how art works. Like, no one even needs to be taught. Each and everyone, maybe we don't have the privilege that you do, or we have a lot to lose, or we are just plain scared. But these are the realities that we face, that you probably do not face, or that you don't know about, but you need to talk about when you have the space to. So from that, we started the penning project, like the letters to my friends, and people would just write st their stories. Stories of encouragement, stories of pain, 
stories to the government, stories to their church leaders, and then along the way some people who are not able to write began drawing, others began singing, and so the project grew over and over again. Who funded it? Nobody actually did because it was more of a social project. So for it to be like a safe space, different people would meet in different spheres. Because even at office, there are people who will not come because they are not closet. There are people who I talk to that I have never met because they cannot be seen with me because I am out and just them being seen with me is going to out them. And even for me, being out has been a struggle. And even coming out was not something that was voluntary for me. I just woke up one day and my picture was all over the media. And looking at everything that I lost when I came out, I felt that this project is powerful because it gives people a chance to be seen without exactly being seen. And a lot has grown out of it from the stories we have recently published, the first research on the realities of LGBTQ women, and we just accumulated this different data from different stories of people's experience and come up with this very beautiful research to help people understand like this, these are what these are the recommendations, these are the things we go through, this is how we think you can support us, this is yeah. Of that actual expression. So it becomes a barrier 
to that freedom. We think we're sort of empowering freedom or building capacity, but yet we're not actually surrendering to what might be possible and trying to facilitate as many intersections as possible. And it wouldn't have been, we couldn't have done it without 32 Degrees East, which is a, an artist residency space in Kampala that has been a force and, and also a home to many creatives and, and people trying to figure out how to express themselves in the city. Thank you so much. I'm going to briefly open it up to the floor for questions. We can take, I guess, about two questions. Please do keep your questions brief and not long and discursive. Um, lots of intriguing points of entry here from the pragmatic and the, and the funding side right through to the, the, the act of centralizing art as, as a functional part of integrating communities. Anybody want to ask questions? Victims of uh, the atrocities that were committed by the law of the resistance. 
and my question would be that do you also have stories from that narrative that are contra that one? That because what I know is that sometimes when a government goes into a place to crash an insurgent, some of the locals actually will suffer. We had it in Kenya, there was a time when there was an insurgent in Western Kenya and the government sent the military to go and hand down the you know the leaders, the, the rebel movement. So they were eventually hunted and killed. But the locals suffered because the government thought that the locals had actually been collaborating with this people. And so I'm not very sure if this is alien to Uganda that these stories, can, we can only say that it is the Lord's resistance army that committed atrocities in that area and that the government of the Warren Seven, when it went to hand down uh, Joseph Kony and his people, did not commit those atrocities. So, to what extent does that literature that you've captured also captures that narrative from the other? Yeah, I mean, I think. Um uh, just for people who don't know, the war between the Lord's Resistance Army and the government of Uganda lasted for about two decades, and the, the LRA are still active um, at the moment. And um, so during that time, people were forcibly put into displacement camps, um, and up to two million people lived in, in these camps. So I think that is actually where a lot of the critique comes out, and where you see it in some of the artwork. Um, so myself and, and Bastri Bon Quente um, have sort of done this kind of call and response around a body of work called Ganki Kome and other things we left behind. Um, and that is a series of photographs of humanitarian rations that were left behind and they're installed like tombstones uh, in the landscape and there's a permanent installation um, in blue in the north of Uganda now. So, what that work talks about is again not going down to these essential narratives of, yeah, but the government committed atrocities too, but what were the lived realities of people during that time? And if you talk to people across the north of Uganda, yes, there was bodily harm, yes, there was bodily violence, yes, there are these extreme, extraordinary events of, of, of various um, traumas. But one of the things that comes up a lot is, but we lived in camps, and we lived in camps for a really long time, and we didn't choose to go into those camps, and those camps weren't secure, and, and soldiers were often at the center, and so when the LRA would attack, humans were used as shields, um, and, and at the height of the war, there was more people dying within the camps than from the LRA, and so those are some of the accountability issues that come up that aren't necessarily addressed in, in the issues of, of, say, the ICC or the, the courts or the, the sort of memorials around. Um, but that's what we need to also be listening to is how uh, is the research and the way in which an artist chooses to engage in that research telling of those different realities rather than locking in on a particular political statement and expecting an extraction. Okay, and I think that's a great note on which to end and this notion of the critical role of the arts as an interpretive reframing of very complex realities um, in ways that are nuanced and are responsive to, to lived experiences and are not just purely posturing. Uh, we are now, thank you so much to our panel, we can get a round of applause. And